Hello, everyone. Hello, Francesca. Good Hi, Shir. How are you? We have a Good. special guest today. Before yeah. we start, though, and we're letting people, there's still people joining us, I see. I see that people are still joining us. Um, and before we welcome everybody to our weekly Zooming in, Shir, somehow your screen got changed a little yeah. bit, so it looks a little cropped, but earlier it didn't. So if you can, I don't know if you have any magic touch that you can apply to your screen share. <laughs> and I'm then we trying, get started. but I, I'm not sure I can, I hope we'll, it'll be fixed as soon as we, as we get into the presentation, but I'll try okay. to see what I can do. We'll, right we'll do our best. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, okay. almost afternoon. One minute yeah. afternoon, everyone. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to Zoom again, our bi-weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life at UC Berkeley. I am Shir Gal Kohavi, and joining me is Francesca Spagnolo, our head curator. And today we have a special guest, India Mandelkorn, who is a UC Berkeley uh, PhD student. She graduated in 2015 in the history department. She later worked at the LA County Museum for a couple of years, where she developed a project about urban light. I hope we have a few minutes for you to share some insights about urban lights with us today. Uh, and she's now uh, publishing a book about the project, which is coming up in the fall, called City of Electric Rooms. Uh, India worked with Francesco on the project that we'll be discussing today. And before we dig into and discuss our wonderful exhibition, um, I just want to um, review a few house, house rules. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar, so all our participants have their video cameras turned off. Uh, on the bottom of the screen, you have two very useful buttons. You can use the chat button to tell us where you're zooming in from or let us know if you have any technical difficulties. And please use the Q&A button to send us any questions that you might have. We'll spend a few minutes at the end of the talk answering any questions that come up. Um, throughout the, this uh, spring semester, Francesco and I have been reflecting and will be reflecting in the next talks on exhibitions presented at the, Mag at the Magnus over the last decade, highlighting how they, they will be revised in the context of time capsules, a new exhibition which we hope to open in the coming fall. As a last reminder, the Magnus Collection is one of the largest Jewish museum collections in the world and one of the top three in the United States. It's the only one in the world associated with a major research university. Today we'll be looking, we'll be going back in time briefly and looking at uh, Gourmet Ghettos, Modern Food Rituals, as, uh, which is an exhibition that Francesco and India curated to get jointly together in 2015. I want to start by inviting the two of you, Francesco and India, to tell us a little bit about your, your experience working together, working on this exhibition, um, in the past talks, and yeah, Francesco and I were bringing all kinds of examples of exhibitions that were curated along with other scholars and students. And it's such a treat and a pleasure to have you join us today and, and share a little bit of your own experience. So, so please, if the two of you don't mind, the stage is all yours. Yes. Well, first of all, India, it's so good to see you again. It's been a while. And yeah. uh, it was a joy to, to collaborate on this project. And we, we've, we've stayed connected since. So it, it, we, we, we did good, right? It oh, was yeah. a good project. And we, we, we remained friends afterwards. And, uh, and that's a good sign in terms of uh, how the project and the, the exhibition <laughs> went, uh, I, I believe. And so it's really a pleasure to have you back and rethink. Uh, we go back a few years, uh, 2014. Um, it was a it was a very very rich exhibition with a lot of objects. I can't remember how many, but but well over a hundred. And we see here our, our ritual table and 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 a, an array of paintings in the in the vitrine part of the of the installation at the Magnus. It's a, it's the same vitrine that's on the background of Shear's uh, Zoom call uh, on 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 her left. Uh, with a and, different exhibition. <laughs> with a different exhibition, of course, and um, and. Uh, it was, it was a, well, India, you remember you and I met uh, sort of serendipitously at the, I think it was a digital humanities seminar. And uh, I heard about your interest in taste and you were, you were writing a dissertation with our, our mutual friend and colleague, Tom LaCour, uh, on, on the history of taste. And I immediately seized the opportunity to bring you into the Magnus and, 
thing together. And eventually that became a collaboration and an exhibition. And we, we, we brought our, our different areas of competence uh, together. And it was sort of the, the first uh, exhibition at the Magnus that was fully co-curated with a graduate student. So it was a pioneering exhibition in that respect. We've been talking each week about the different modes of, uh, of uh, um, creating exhibitions and that of, of working with graduate students is for me one of the most exciting because graduate students are, you know, I remember those days when, you know, we would read two, three books a day. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it's a time in life when, you know, uh, students have all kinds of sources and ideas at their fingertips and very critical approaches and so on. Uh, what do you remember about how the project uh, uh, evolved, how, oh, well, how we was, started? It was so much fun. Um, I mean, I think for me as a graduate student, it was such a cool opportunity because we're spending so much time um, writing a dissertation, thinking about one audience, and you know, ultimately, in, at the end of the day, I mean, only a handful of people are going to read your dissertation. But this was a really great way to think about multiple audiences that are going to come into a museum. Um, you have different stories; people are coming into museums for such different reasons. Um, so, for me, it was a really wonderful way to learn how to be more accessible and to reach different audiences on different levels. Also, I mean, when you're in a space of a museum, um, people aren't necessarily going in chronological order. It's not like a, you know, a text that you have to read from beginning to end. So I think it gives you a lot of flexibility to, um, to tell stories in a different way. And it also, what I really took from it was that you know, I was studying 17th and 18th century England. This was stuff that totally was not in my wheelhouse at all. But I think that it was, it, and I remember I did this toward the end of, it was one of my last years in grad school. It really gives you the confidence to think about something more broadly and to apply some of the, you know, analytical skills or the critical thinking skills, writing that, you know, to a completely different situation. So um, I really, for me, it's been fantastic. And um, I think, you know, to be honest, I I don't know if I would have gotten my job at LACMA if I hadn't had this kind of hands-on experience and learned all the different bits and pieces and all the work that has to go into building an exhibition, which is way more collaborative, um, very different than writing a dissertation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. By the way, what, what we have on 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 screen, on the on the screen that uh, the image that Shiri is sharing is, uh, is a, one of our early Instagram photos. So it was 2014, we were That's starting early. on Instagram. <laughs> so there is even a tag of the Magnus, right? It's, it's an Instagram tag. Uh, uh, so, you know, a little bit of memory lane from, from that uh, perspective as well, but a, an array of objects and, and really an array of dimensions that we explored as we're trying to explain, uh, combining our mutual areas of expertise. I was bringing in my expertise on, on Jewish ritual uh, life in India, you were looking at, uh, at the issues of taste and the dynamics around social dynamics around food. So it was it was uh, it was good to find this confluence of of ideas. Yeah, and I'm really appreciative, especially of us thinking of Jewish ritual cult ritual um, cultures and ritual um, and rituals in general, because one of the things that's so typical to these rituals is that we all come together around the table, and we'll see the ritual table in a little in a few slides but we've been living in a pandemic for more than a year now. And this has been quite a different experience. So I wonder if the two of you might want to share a couple of your personal experiences um, of you know, Jewish rituals, or maybe you created new ritual, rituals or had socially distant rituals uh, during that time. Um, so why don't you share? India, to what, what, what happened? Sure, sure. Well, food yeah. habits and food rituals during the um, pandemic. Yeah, well, on a Jewish <laughs> ritual level, um, I, the first, I mean, I guess now there's been, you know, two Passovers during this pandemic, but um, the first one, I remember um, the family member tried to have a Zoom and nobody, I mean, it was very early on, nobody knew how to use the Zoom. It was probably, um, it was a really challenging Passover to get through everything. And I think that it ended up being very, very, very short. Um, but I think most obviously, <laughs> hand washing became a really huge thing um, during the pandemic. And I just remember very vividly 
one of the first times going out to get Thai, get takeout Thai food because everyone was saying, you know, support local restaurants, get takeout. And I think that, you know, very early on in the pandemic when we didn't really know much about how it was, you know, how COVID was transmitted. I mean, we probably washed our hands 50 times between leaving my house and getting in the car and coming back again, just opening everything. So I think that, you know, that really sticks out at me at just how how often, how I've just kind of internalized this new way of, you know, looking at the, <laughs> um, preparing to eat a meal. Um, so that's what sticks out at me. So, you know, in a pandemic, a, a, a Kiddush cup set like the one we have on, on display on screen right now would not really work so well unless it was within consumption within a bubble. Uh, and uh, but this is this is a a, a, a a set that really speaks to conviviality and uh, the idea of partaking of wine. So it's poured in the cup of it was inscribed for for Rabbi Reichert and donated to the Magnus by him. Rabbi Reichert was by his family, but Rabbi Reichert was a rabbi in San Francisco in the 1920s and 30s. He visited Nazi Germany, came back sounding the alarm for the for the California community in favor, you know, to, to rallying people to to support the, the, the attempts of German Jews to run away from Germany at the time. I think it was there in 1933 and then 1937, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a piece of Bay Area history, this, uh, this uh, Kiddush Cup set, but also speaks to the idea of food as something that has to do with sociability. And clearly the Passover Seder is also about that. And uh, the, 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 the zooming part of it did not hit me. So in, our, in my case, uh, we actually had a very reduced Passover Seder at home, just uh, just uh, in our in my immediate family. Uh, but I uh, there were also ritual concerns around the use of electricity during during a festival, which is uh, uh, prohibited on, in in certain views of uh, of Jewish uh, uh, ritual. But uh, I remember actually reading a rabbi a rabbi from originally rabbi from Venice, Italy, who uh, and I think sure we're talking about Italy in the coming weeks, right? So we'll yes. we'll. we'll We'll deal with that in, in due course, mm -hmm. but uh, but uh, that that actually was in, in favor of an Orthodox rabbi who was writing in favor of using Zoom for the Passover Seder, um, and uh, and had pretty pretty interesting arguments. So uh, in a way, the pandemic prompted a, a re revisiting of of the canons of Jewish ritual around food. But what what we discussed in our project and our exhibition in India was of how pervasive food ritual is and how essential coessential it is to to Jewish life, and how at the same time it also parallels uh, some modern attitudes, ritualistic attitudes to, towards food. Uh, we, we presented an array of, of documents, and here, Shir, thank you for sharing this. Uh, um, I think this the image here became the icon with which we, we uh, marketed the exhibition. By the way, the exhibition you were remembering uh, when we presented and, and, and mentioning how a variety of people come to an exhibition, we don't really know what the audience will be. In this case, the exhibition was also the center of a, of a national and international conference, uh, the, the Council of American Jewish Museums that met in the Bay Area uh, uh, while the exhibition was, was there. And we had a whole plenary session with uh, guests, et cetera, that you and I, India, coordinated uh, as part of the conference. So we had, a, we had quite an audience you know, in all sorts of ways. It was great. This is a, a, a pop-up card, so it should open up like this. It's a, it's a 3D card. They were printed in Germany at the turn of the 20th century and then clearly written in English and, and distributed for the American market. And it's a family in a sukkah, in the, the, the sort of the, the hut, the, the, the impermanent living abode that's built during the festival of Sukkot. And everybody's clearly eating and they also have the help uh, serving the soup from a nice uh, soup pot. Thank you, Francesca. One of the things that I found really fascinating was the title of this exhibition, because uh, the two of you thought about basically used a pun. And I wonder if you're willing to share a little bit of how you came up with the title and, and what does it imply? Um, well, Francesco came up with the title, so um, feel free to chime in whenever yeah. you like. Um, I remember very vividly when we came up with it, but um, I mean, I think that we wanted to do something a little tongue in cheek. And I know that the term gourmet ghetto is, is a loaded term. And, and I haven't been in Berkeley for a few years, but I've realized, I've seen news that you know, they're considering getting rid of the name um, whatsoever. But 
I think we wanted to play on the idea. I think that food is a really good idea to kind of think about the idea of an inclusion and exclusion. And um, obviously the gourmet ghetto was a self-imposed term um, in Berkeley. It came up, we don't really know when it started, but um, it was probably the late seventies, early eighties. Um, and they used it at the time as a, as a tongue in cheek thing. Yes, it was, you know, people that chose to go there and um, they were, you know, eating luxury food, but I think it also kind of, you know, gestured to a set of attitudes and practices that maybe differentiated the, what they were eating there than, than anywhere else. And that was something I thought we were really interested in with in the exhibition. Um, the gourmet ghetto, you know, in Berkeley was somewhere where people cared about things that were organic or locally sourced, or, you know, um, they knew where the food came from. They knew the chef. Um, it wasn't processed. Um, so they were really defining it in, you know, in contrast to um, to other places. And I think that we wanted to apply come, some of the same kinds of thinking um, to the exhibition and how these rituals define, you know, one people in opposition to, um, you know, everything else to create an identity. So, um, Francesco, feel free to pop in. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, it was, a, it was a, it was, it was a pun and it was, it was a, a bit of a polemical pun. I, I never quite got the idea of, of, of calling a place a ghetto and a gourmet ghetto seemed, seemed like a, a bit of a cognitive dissonance as a scholar of Italian ghettos and life and culture in the Italian ghettos. Uh, again, the word ghetto comes from Italy. It's one of the, one of the contributions of, of my homeland to world culture, I guess. And, um, and there were places of both inclusion and exclusion in, uh, originally. So I think Everything you you mentioned in there continues to resonate with me, and it was a the idea that you know the Magnus and its uh, holdings could uh, have a take on Berkeley. So not just being in Berkeley, but also have a say about Berkeley. I was personally uh, interested and and somewhat pleased when the when from within the Gourmet Ghetto itself and the city of Berkeley, very recently over the last year, questions arose about uh, this term and whether. Berkeley should have a gourmet uh, ghetto. But in our case, it was really just a way, a, a way to catch the attention. Um, I remember at the opening, we also in, invited Narce David to come mm -hmm. and speak, who was one of the inventors of the ghetto, uh, yeah. of, the, of the Berkeley uh, gourmet ghetto. And, uh, and we, it was a, also a rubric for us to really investigate the collection wide and large. We had recently received a wonderful gift. We're seeing it here on, on the screen. Um, Yves Moselsio, a photographer uh, who continues to be based in, in the Bay Area, but he had shot these photographs. They're part of a, a broader project uh, called The Fruit of Our Labor on Orthodox uh, Jews in the Workplace. And there were several, of course, because traditional Orthodox Jewish life is very connected with the preparation, consumption, conservation, uh, sharing of, uh, of partaking of food in, in uh, according to specific uh, uh, guidelines. So many of the photos in the in the in the collection that he donated, there were his photographs made in Chicago in the in the 1990s, the late 1990s, depicted individuals who are connected with the food industry from uh, from uh, overseeing kashrut, the, the rules of, uh, of of preparing uh, food according to to Judaism, to to the sale or the cooking and and, and so on. And so we were inspired by these photographs. They remain a precious part of the collection. Along with actually, if Moselsio had also recorded interviews, oral histories with each of the sitters in his in his portrait. So we also have those in the in the in the archives now, which is uh, really phenomenal. So every one of these images brings stories. And and here, thank you, Shir, for for moving us ahead to another one. This was another another uh, sort of uh, uh, key piece in the in the exhibition from an artistic historical point of view. It's uh, part of a, a set of, of uh, costume drawings uh, by by Rebach for the for the Moscow Yiddish Theater in 1920. So this is very rare and phenomenal uh, materials. And here Queen Esther is is represented in green as a pickle. She she even has a pickle barrel around her with her name written in Yiddish in red. And, uh, but it's it, the, the reason why Queen Esther is, is read is actually scriptural. And the Talmud, there is a whole 
uh, meditation, we, we put it, thank you for sharing that as well, share with us, but uh, we, we put the original text of the Talmud, uh, a Talmud that uh, attracted Megillah, uh, in which uh, her, the meaning of, of Esther's Hebrew name Hadassah is connected to, to vegetation, to myrtle, and to being green. And therefore, Esther is sometimes traditionally represented as looking somewhat green, maybe not a pickle, maybe that's a bit too much, but uh, still green and vegetable and somewhat edible. Yeah. Um, India, I wonder if you're, if you're willing to share with us, uh, now that you're looking back at this period and, you know, since then graduating, working as a restaurant consultant and you know, maybe you're willing to share a little more with us about your food-related experience, about other maybe projects, other interests. Um, well, um, I haven't really worked in, um, f I mean, this was a great, I don't know, th this is a lot of fun. And um, I, I've written about food in a whole bunch of publications. Um, but right now, I mean, my interests have kind of taken me more towards urban planning in cities. Um, but um, I do what I do. I do think about taste every day. I'm, I'm in 2019. I became a sommelier, and um, so I'm teaching people how to, you know, appreciate wine and understand what goes into it. And so it's kind of like a really cool way that my dissertation has gone full circle. Instead of thinking about the significance of the sense of taste and how did we use this as a a form of knowledge to understand the natural world, um, our bodies, um, how we relate to others. Um, I'm now looking at, you know, trying to give people the vocabulary to under look at wine, taste it, and understand, you know, where it came from and who made it, and you know how old it is and things like that. So it is a nice it is a nice kind of full circle um, with the stuff that I originally was into, and it was I never could have predicted it, um, which is cool. Um, and, and India, if I can add, the, your contribution to the work we do at the Magnus was really uh, crucial. You provided us with a vocabulary to think about the food rituals that are encapsulated in the many, many me memory objects in the Magnus collection. Uh, as everyone, like the one we're looking at, they all come with a story. This is an 18th century tablecloth. It has the name of the couple that it was embroidered for and has still has, all, speaking of wine, all of the wine stains uh, from from being used, they're still part of the object itself, right? Uh, so, but you really gave us a new vocabulary to to think about these objects and and to to understand their possible meaning even beyond uh, Jewish rituals themselves and and how they 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 help reframe uh, ritual and and the ritual re relationship with uh, food in modern times. So it was uh, a clear example of how you know a methodologically based approach to a topic, in your case, taste and food. Can be transferred from one area you were you were, you were saying you were looking at 18th century Victorian uh, uh, era and, and 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 Victorian era and and instead transferring to to modern Jewish culture it was a it was a leap maybe not so much and this is a this is again down memory lane this is a shot of when we were setting up the ritual table which was one of the centerpieces of the exhibition and I, I remember working with you on selecting each plate each cup and deciding what sequence they should go and finding some kind of a hopefully harmonious way of reconstructing it. And by the way, in time capsules, the exhibition we're presenting in the, in the, in the fall, uh, we'll be reconstructing exactly this table. And so we're, we're rethinking it. And so all these objects are uh, remain dear to us and will be re-offered re to, to, to the public as a way to really think about, there, there's like, um, um, kosher salt shakers and, uh, and uh, of course, books. And then uh, if we go all the way to the right of the screen, we see actually a, a, a set uh, for, for, uh, for the, the halal. It's a, by, by silversmiths that, were, um, that had a, a, a factory that was seized by the Nazis in Germany after 1933. So there, every, as I was saying, every object has a, has a story here. And it's a story that's connected with actual people and, and individuals and families and communities. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice table, but it's also a loaded table in all kinds of ways and yes. made us think about all sorts of ritual relations that we, relationships that we have with food. Yeah, and thank you, Francesca. And I'm hoping that maybe we can spend one or two more minutes thinking about this ritual table because while you say that each one of the objects was so carefully selected and they are 
and they do carry a story with them and they do carry some history. We also see objects that if we wouldn't know the story would be identified as mundane objects we see around the table in our house or during the holidays. And I wonder if the two of you want to quickly talk about, you know, this concept of the ritual table, how we can all see ourselves as sit situated around this table together, um, maybe as a universal value that, uh, that we all can relate to. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, going off of what Francesco said about, you know, me lending a vocabulary, I think that, you know, it kind of worked both ways. Um, and that, you know, I think one of the big takeaways that we got from this exhibition is, yes, you know, we were kind of comparing it to, you know, Berkeley's foodie culture and, and we use that term foodie, you know, in my in my dissertation, it was studying the 18th century, they would talk about these epicures all the time. And but, um, you know, a lot of the same ideas, a lot of the same attitudes, a lot of the same practices, um, you know, were encapsulated in, you know, like in kosher, you know, dietary laws, um, you know, in, in this different culture. So I think what was really cool is that um, this table, yes, it has this specific meaning, you know, for, you know, one culture or another, but at the end of the day, I mean, one having a table, is you know a metaphor for you know instruction for being human i mean one of the things that makes us different from animals is we can eat food any you know they eat food anywhere but we decide to sit down at a table and there 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 are rules there's an order um, whether or not you want to see it in a ritual context or not there is still a lot of sort of unspoken practices that we do different sequencing of how we arrange the meal, what comes first, who sits next to whom, um, you know, when, when do we drink wine, how is it served, um, that are very kind of universal to everybody. And it's one way that I think this exhibition um, really kind of was a springboard to think about, you know, these values more universally, which was really rewarding for me working on it. Yeah. Well, and that actually, that actually leads us, and I'm going to, maybe go a little faster so we'll have a chance to talk about another ritual that we were thinking about today. If that's okay with the two of you. Please. So we selected a few of the, of the objects from the ritual table to show you. And here they all are in their beauty. And hopefully you can visit us in the future and see them in person. And let me point to, sure, if you just go mm -hmm. back to that slide for a second, this, this knife has a very long descriptive title here, and it's a title that describes, it, you know, how packed each of these objects can be, right? Yeah. How, man, how many things can be included in an object? In this case, quotations from the Bible, de depictions of, of, of domesticity, uh, food, and, and so on. So really, each of these objects is incredibly loaded with uh, all kinds, invested with all kinds of meanings. And the same is true for the coffee set you are about to show and took us back. But here yeah. you go, Shira. And here's another ritual that uh, we were thinking um, to maybe discuss as we look at uh, rituals that go a little beyond the table and from different cult and come from different cultures. Uh, so India, Francesco, please. <laughs> well, we we you know we thought about the fact that oftentimes uh, domestic objects encapsulate other kinds of rituals, not necessary, even Jewish domestic objects uh, uh, encapsulate other rituals, in this case, in the, in the Middle East, that of uh, coffee and, uh, and how that, uh, that migrated. I remember I, was, I, I, I then invited you, India, to, to teach a, a, in one of my courses when I was teaching about Jewish nightlife and the arrival of coffee to, to, to Europe uh, in, in the 1500s. And, uh, and, and it's an incredible history, but uh, coffee itself has its own rituals. And sometimes we don't even think too much about it in, in life, but uh, uh, we, we kind of, our, our narrative sort of culminated uh, towards this coffee set to really bring home what you were saying, India, which is that these rituals that are under the rubric of religion can also be transferred into, into the, the, the secular world and become and remain ritualistic uh, uh, even when, when the, the observance of religious mandates is, is factored out. So we continue to, to have in everyday life. And uh, well, again, I'm outing myself as an Italian. I will <laughs> soon have my cup of coffee uh, after lunch. But, uh, uh, but uh, 
um, yes, there, there is a ritual to that. There are ways to eat it and drink coffee to eat food. And, uh, and uh, we, we really pinpointed uh, the, the delicate relationship between religions and secular worlds. And this is a conversation I think each one of our viewers today and all of us can continue for, for a while. So let me um, take this opportunity to thank both of you, especially you and Dia for joining us today. I don't know if we have some questions, but let's take a look before we say goodbye. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think we maybe were self-contained enough that our, our uh, viewers, I may, no, there is a question just popping in right now. Uh, wow, this is an interesting oh, okay. question. Yeah, oh. and, uh, <laughs> yes. So would you consider Judith Chicago's landmark ritual table installation, the dinner party to be an example of all the levels of symbolism which can be embedded into the act of coming together over a meal? This is, I would say that it's a, it's a question, more than a question, it's a, it's a beautiful statement. And I, I personally agree with what our, our viewer listener uh, suggested. So thank you, absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, and I also remember the Living Theater staging a Passover Seder on Judith Molina and, and staging a Passover Seder uh, on, on, in, in, in a theatrical setting. So definitely there is a performative aspect to, to the ritual around food, right? India, do you want to comment? <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah, I think that Francesco summed it up really well, um, but... Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have a lot to add. Um, so I think, this, yes, mm -hmm. maybe sure so, we can conclude with one thought, one parting yeah. thought, which is that well over a hundred objects, I can't remember the total count at the end of this exhibition, but if you remember India, this was our selection. There was so much more in the collection that could Absolutely. be explored, right? So in other words, we could think about another, a, a, a sequel and Absolutely. we think about this in the future. And, um, and before we say goodbye, we want to also invite you to join us in two weeks um, for our next talk Ital about Italia, an island of divine doom, Italian crossroads in Jewish culture, which Francesco and I will be discussing in the context, context of time capsules. I hope we, you can all join us. And in the meantime, thank you, Inda. India, it was educational. It was wonderful. And it was such a treat to have you here. And thank you, Francesco. And we wish you all a wonderful weekend. Thank you both and have Thanks a great so much weekend. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. Okay. Welcome back, India. Great. <laughs> have a great weekend. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody.